Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Montgomery County Council's July, Tuesday, July 20th session. Uh, we have no proclamations this morning. I do want to say Eid Mubarak to all those celebrating today. The Islamic tradition of caring for our neighbors in need carries special meaning this year as we recover from a deadly pandemic and a historic recession. I want to thank all of our Muslim neighbors who have helped lead our response over the past year by distributing thousands of meals and household supplies and bags of emergency food assistance. We are a much richer, richer community because of your commitment. Best wishes for a safe and meaningful holiday. On to general business. Madam Clerk, could you please share the announcements, agenda changes, or petitions? Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning, Council Members. There is an addendum this morning. Item number two, deleted, briefing Board of Investment Trustees, Environmental Social Governance Issues, Go Committee Work Session will be scheduled at a later date. Item 4E on the consent calendar, a correction to the introduction, special appropriation to the county government's FY22 operating budget, COVID-19 human services and community assistance, non-departmental account, $2,946,776 for Por Nuestra Salud y Bienestar, for Our Health and Well-Being, Source of Funds Federal Grant, American Rescue Plan Act, public hearing action is scheduled for 7-27-21 at 1.30 p.m. On the consent calendar for F, correction, introduction special appropriation to the county government's FY22 operating budget, COVID-19 human services and community assistance non-departmental account, $1,701,809 for African American Health Program COVID Response Source of Funds Federal Grant American Rescue Plan Act and resolution to amend the county government's FY22 operating budget resolution 19-872 Section G, designation of entities for non-competitive contract award status, the National Center for Children and Families, Inc. Public hearing action is scheduled for seven 2721 at 1 30 p.m. Added 4M to the consent calendar. Introduction special appropriation to the county government's FY22 operating budget. Department of Health and Human Services $2,903,172. Department of Recreation $300,000. Community Engagement Cluster $333,000. And Montgomery County Public Schools $1,585,000. $633 for newcomers, enhancements, and assistance, source of funds, general fund reserves. Public action, pu public hearing action is scheduled for 7-27-21 at 1.30 p.m. Added to the consent calendar for N, introduction, special appropriation to the county government's FY22 operating budget, Department of Health and Human Services, $816.00. $816.67 for Community Services Block Grant, Source of Funds, Community Services Block Grant Supplemental Cares Act. Public hearing action is scheduled for 7-27-21 at 1.30 p.m. Added for O, Introduction, Special Appropriation to the County Government's FY22 Operating Budget, Department of Health and Human Services, 970 $970,360 for FY22 American Rescue Plan funding increase for Head Start programs, source of funds, Head Start American Rescue Plan. Public hearing action is scheduled for 72721 at 1.30 p.m. Added for P, introduction, special appropriation to the county government's FY22 operating budget, Department of Health and Human Services, $1,150,000 for Asian American Health Initiative, COVID Response, Source of Funds, Federal Grant, American Rescue Plan Act. Add a correction to 13B, Legislative Session Day 19, Introduction of Bills, Bill 3221, Personnel, Employee Settlement Agreements with No Rehire Clause Prohibited. Lead sponsor, Council President Hooker. Public hearings is scheduled for September 14th, 21 at 1.30 p.m. Added at 2.50, proposed closed section to consult with Council to obtain legal advice pursuant to Maryland Code General Provisions, Article Section 3-305B7, and to consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals 
about pending or potential litigation pursuant to Maryland Code General Provisions Article Section 3-305B8. Topic is Fraternal Order of Police versus Montgomery County. In addition, the council has received a petition from residents of Montgomery County opposing ZTA 19-07 Telecommunications Towers Limited Use. That is all, Mr. President. Oh, that was a lot of changes, Madam Clerk. I feel like we can adjourn. Um, well done. Um, the clerk has also distributed the minutes to council members for the meeting of May 11th, 2021 and the closed session minutes of June 15th, 21. Are there any changes? Hearing no objections, the minutes are approved as submitted. Again, item two has been removed from the agenda, will be taken up by the GO committee. Uh, we can now sit for district council. Item 3A is an introduction for zoning text amendment 2104, overlay zone, Germantown, Churchill Village. Let me recognize the chair of the Fed committee, Chairman Reamer, and then legislative attorney, Ms. Ndu. Chairman Reamer. Thank you, Mr. Council President. Well, this is just an introduction, so uh, I don't have much to say about it. We will take it up at committee. Um, and uh, thank you so much. Great, thanks. I'm not sure uh, about my notes here. Okay, item 3B is a work session on subdivision regulation amendment 2101, exemptions, alcohol production, and agritourism. Action is tentatively scheduled for 72721. Same deal, right? Well, no, this one. No, this one was, I beg your pardon. Chairman Reamer. Right, thank you. Yeah, this one, uh, the committee uh, had a, an extensive session on, and we had some follow up discussion, and now we have. Uh, what I think is a uh, full, you know, uh, product. We have a product for the county council's deliberation here. So uh, I'll just provide a very short overview and then pass it on to our excellent staff, Ms. Nadu. Um, th this is a proposal that the county executive uh, brought to us that is intended to streamline a important part of the development process for properties in the agricultural reserve that are trying to do wineries or similar kinds of facilities, you know, they presently are required to go through a pretty extensive uh, property process called subdivision that can be expensive and it can be time consuming. And what they would like to be able to do is not have to go through that record platting, but rather just work directly with the Office of Ag and the executive branch uh, to move through the development process and not have to record a plat. Um, I think that is a wise change for us to allow, given the context of Ag Reserve uh, as the property setting where this would happen. You know, it's not something we would necessarily want to do in an urbanized area or in a suburban, you know, community, but in areas where we have reserved the land for you know, ongoing use of, of farming and supporting farming activities. I think it is a uh, reasonable way to proceed that has pretty small, you know, impacts and potentially pretty significant benefits uh, for, you know, our ability to help these properties uh, do what I think the community is hoping that they will do. So, uh, which is deliver a, a facility that, you know, will improve the quality of life for everybody in the county. Um, so we had an extensive discussion at the committee we asked the planning board and the executive branch to confer uh, with additional comments and, and send us memos. Um, my colleagues on the committee, uh, you know, we, it was a unanimous vote at the committee, but my colleagues expressed their interest in reviewing carefully what we heard from the executive branch and, and from planning. And, uh, you know, I, I understand, my understanding is that, uh, well, I'll not, I'll not, uh, characterize that any further, um, you know, if, if they wish to bring up any further points, they, they may. Uh, so, again, we have a committee recommendation to the council. I will ask uh, LaVue to, to describe it in detail because it is, um, you know, it's important to get, it's a little bit complicated. But uh, in any event, I think that probably covers the, the, the introductory uh, comments that are needed. So, I'll turn it to you, LaVue. Thank you. Good morning, council members. So what this SRA does is, well, first I'll start with some background. So before DPS can issue a commercial building permit, that building has to be shown on a lot, and that lot has to be on a record plot, and then that's what triggers the subdivision. Um, as council member Reamer said, it's a really cost prohibitive and lengthy process. Um, so the goals of this SRA is it would 
remove, we would note these agricultural uses would no longer have to go through that subdivision process, which would basically help promote the ag reserve, which is one of the goals of the county. Uh, there is a public hearing, and during that public hearing, all, almost all the testimony was in support. Um, a lot of the, it was a lot of landowners um, and other farmers and owners of these types of businesses who testified that the reason it's cost prohibitive is not just the county fees, but there's legal fees. And then to go through the subdivision process, they often have to hire surveyors and civil engineers, etc. cetera. Um, so the two uses that are affected here are Accessory agricultural education and tourism, and that's what's being called agritourism, and then farm alcohol production. So for the first one, for the agritourism use, um, that one is actually a little bit easier because in the definition, there's already a 10% cap on the total footprint of all structures that can be used on the site. Um, because it's considered an accessory use to the farming. But with farm alcohol production, the definition is much broader, and it includes wineries, cideries, breweries, distilleries, um, all those types of uses. And that can, of course, then mean that that also includes tasting rooms, prepping and selling food, and then having events such as wedding and corporate events. So I do have planning, I do have staff here from planning, DPS, and the Office of Agriculture. Um, but to summarize their thoughts, um, planning raised an issue because these can be kind of large commercial uses. Imagine a venue that has 250 people. Um, and because of that, usually in the subdivision process, that's where you work through things like water and septic systems, um, delivery truck drivers, a need for additional parking. All of that usually gets resolved through subdivision. But what came up during the Fed committee is that planning and DPS and the Office of Agriculture actually already work on those issues. So all those things would get checked regardless of whether this, you actually go through the subdivision process. Um, so the crux of the issue became, okay, if we exempt these uses from having to go through the planning process, do we know that we will still make sure all of those things are checked? So the committee asked for a joint memo from OAG and DPS, which planning responded to. Um, and based on those memos, the answer was yes. The difference would be instead of planning being the clearinghouse to make sure all of that process is completed, um, OAG and DPS actually have a sort of pre-design meeting. Um, and that process is actually free. Um, and they would make sure that the applicant gets all the permits that they need and that all the different agencies have input. Because one of the things that happens is you have a whole bunch of, in, of different agencies that are involved because Department of Transportation has to be there. You have to make sure you have the water and septic. You have to have all different types of permits. Sometimes that includes environmental checks and historic preservation and all those different types of things. So the joint memo is attached to the packet. Um, but planning's response um, to using those pre-design meetings instead of their development review committee was that their, that process needs to be more formalized so that if the council decides to approve this SRA, then OAG and DPS would need to go through their pre-design consultation process and make sure that it has things like mandated timelines to make sure the application is moving smoothly, that there's an agenda, that all the different agencies participate, um, and clarifying what the applicant's role in that meeting would be. Um, so that's the summary of where the SRA stands currently. If there's any questions, I can answer them. And again, we have OAG, DPS, and planning here as well. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Rice and I and Councilmember Glass had an amendment. Um, can you remind us whether we need to move that or whether the committee had uh, figured out how to address that in the course of the amendment? It was a specific issue. Uh, yes, so the amendment that had been put forward before the Fed Committee was to include the the way the, the, the SRA was originally written is it just said for these uses in the agricultural reserve, but mm -hmm. there are sometimes these uses in the RE and RE, RE1 and RE2 zone. So that's what the amendment was. But actually during the Fed Committee, um, we realized that there's actually even more zones than that that could have these uses. So the amendment before the council that yes, the council could move today um, would just say that anywhere these uses exist, they would get that exemption. Okay, thank you. And then that amendment is, you, you've described that on page four of the packet. Um, and where can we actually see the, the language of the amendment? So the amendment itself, the language is on uh, circle page three, 
or line 27 of the ZTA. And it says agricultural land used for farm alcohol production or agritourism, an unflatted parcel used for farm alcohol production or for accessory agricultural ed education and tourism would be okay. exempt. Super. Well, I will pass it to my colleague, Councilmember Rice, uh, you know, to share a little background and perhaps uh, he'll he'll move the amendment uh, and maybe Councilmember Glass will second it. But just a little, there's, there's, a, there's an interesting history to it. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure we uh, bring that out today. But um, there is the committee recommendation for the council and we're, we're optimistic. I just want to, again, sort of characterize this. I think of it as a, a way of doing economic development for the Ag Reserve where rather than putting as much onus on the applicant to hire lawyers and go through a legal process, we're using our Office of Ag in a, an effective way to support a project. And you know the Office of Ag has the capacity to help these projects. There aren't that many of them. So they can use their staff time to help coordinate and facilitate an applicant moving through a process so that we can cover all the bases that the county needs to have covered without putting the onus on the applicant and in the legal process uh, through subdivision regulation. So I think kind of very broadly, that's what we learned at committee is that the Office of Ag can kind of shepherd this thing through. And I think from our perspective, you know, it's sort of viewing it as something that like an MCEDC would do with a major corporate you know, location, they would help it move through the process. And so we can alleviate some of the cost and, and effort and also provide support to a project um, to help help it succeed. So uh, there's committee amendment and I'll pass it back to the council president. And, and again, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll have an amendment. Uh, uh, yeah, committee recommendation, we'll have an amendment to, uh, to add to it. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of colleagues wanna speak, council member Rice. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Chair Reamer and uh, the Fed Committee for all of your great work on this. And of course, to Ms. Nadu, thank you so much for bringing all of this together. Chair Reamer, I couldn't agree with you more about what you said. Um, you know, this happened to Windridge Vineyards, which uh, some of you know I live uh, very, very close to. And so uh, I was actually talking to them about what was going on and asking them how their process was going. And they highlighted that this was a challenge for them. Uh, immediately reached out to the county executive and wanted to thank my staff, my chief of staff, Sharon Ledner, uh, who followed up with the county executive and the county executive for sending this over. Uh, and then for the work that ensued, um, if we are serious about making sure that we're competitive in this market and promoting our agricultural reserve, if we're serious about the fact that we want to see this as an economic development opportunity uh, for so many uh, and make sure that uh, the Ag Reserve is not just something pretty to visit, uh, but it's also a place where we see agricultural production uh, happening uh, and jobs as a result of it, then we have to do things like this. Um, we do it in other areas where we're making it easier for businesses to operate. Uh, and we want to do the same thing in our agricultural reserve as well. And in all of those areas where, and thank you for highlighting, Mr. Chair, the amendment, where we see agricultural education or tourism, and that's the thing. Um, you know, as chair of the Education and Culture Committee, let me just say how important it is for us to continue uh, to showcase to our young people about what it is uh, that agriculture represents. Uh, it is incredibly important, and we only have to look to uh, what happened during COVID to where we actually had food shortages and challenges. We see it in other uh, countries uh, to where it cripples government. And so if we don't have strong food production, uh, we don't have these avenues for agriculture to continue to, uh, you know, thrive and flourish. Uh, we're going to have huge issues in our future. Uh, and so from that perspective, I just really want to thank everybody again for the work. I would like to move uh, the uh, accessory agricultural education and tourism uh, or farm alcohol production or for agricult uh, accessory agricultural education and tourism. Uh, as a part of uh, the work of the, the Fed committee. So thank you, Ms. Nadu, uh, for placing that in there. Um, and I think it's really important. I really want to thank Councilmember Glass uh, for his partnership as well as you, Chair Reamer. So. I second. 
Great. So, all right, should have a vote on the amendment and then uh, vote on the underlying ZTA. Back to you, Council President. Council, Council Member Rice has moved. Council Member Glass has seconded. All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. Terrific. That's unanimous. Uh, Council Member Juwando is next. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, really appreciate the work of my colleagues on this. This is a uh, uh, an important, uh, you know, change. Uh, we've all, I think, we all have seen the great uh, agrotourism and, and uses that have popped up in the ag reserve and want to support that. Uh, we've also all had a desire to streamline our regulatory processes, and I think this is a good example of achieving uh, both of those goals, an economic development goal, quality of life goal, and, and making it a little easier without sacrificing uh, the, the needed coordination uh, and uh, regulatory framework that needs to be in place. So I also want to thank uh, Ms. Nadu and planning and DTS, um, and uh, or GPS rather, and our entire app in the Office of Ag, of course, for going offline and, and we're huddling and working together and coming back with a, with a good compromise. So uh, really appreciate it and just wanted to signal my thanks and excited that we're gonna be able to move this forward. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, council member. Okay, all those in favor of the bill as amended, please raise your hand. Is this a roll call or is this a- Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's an SRA, I so I don't know. An SRA, uh, yeah. Council member Katz. Yeah, Mr. President, it says on the agenda that we're not going to vote on this. I beg your system. pardon. You're right. It's a work session. I'm sorry. I'm getting all these messages in the real time here. I'll... I'm supportive of it. Let me be clear. Okay, better attention. Okay, we have an amended. We have an amended bill. We're going to uh, move on uh, and uh, take this up on 727. Right next week. Okay, great. Uh, sorry, everybody. Uh, item uh, C is a work session on. ZTA 2101, sign ordinance, bus shelter advertising, actions tentatively scheduled for next week as well. Let me turn it back to Chairman Reamer. Okay, well, this one is a uh, very small change. Uh, it just- I'm sorry, uh, uh, Council Member Glass, are you good? Were you on the last? Okay, you're good. Chairman Reamer, sorry. Okay, uh, the county executive has requested that we make a minor adjustment to how our bus shelter, well, county executive wants to change how we do bus shelters. You might remember that we have a contract or have had a contract with a company that provided advertising, it was allowed to advertise in the bus shelters and then had a maintenance responsibility for them. Executive now feels the need to change approach. Apparently that approach isn't really viable and they want to separate the maintenance from the advertising and there is a small issue with the permitting that needs to be resolved in order to do that. And that's what this change would allow. So didn't require much discussion at the committee and uh, uh, I'll turn it to you, Ms. Nadu. So I don't have too much to add um, other than so under the current zoning ordinance in the exempt sign section, it included franchise agreements and the ZTA would add licensing agreements as well. Um, I do want to note that there aren't any other substantive changes. This is really a minor technical amendment. So the sign codes can stay the same in terms of like type and size and height and content um, and all of those things. So it's a pretty minor technical amendment to let the county executive keep working on those agreements for both the bus shelter advertising and the bus shelter maintenance. Um, and yes, this one is scheduled for action next week. Terrific. And I don't see any questions. Everybody good? Okay. I think we can move on. We'll take that up next week. Thanks to the Fed Committee. Um, next is the hearing examiner's report and recommendation on local map amendment H140. Let me turn it over to um, Mr. Baumgartner. Are you here? Or, or Lynn Robeson Hannon is here? Or not? Mr. Baumgartner? Mr. Baumgartner is here. That's correct. That counts yeah. President Hucker. Um, good morning, everyone, uh, council president and council members and staff. Um, my name is Derek Baumgartner, hearing examiner with the Office of Zoning and Administrative Hearings. This is before you as um, H140 is a local map amendment. Uh, the property is located at 8860 Piney Branch Road. The applicant is Park Montgomery LP. The developer is um, Enterprise Community uh, Development, Inc. I'm here to present my report for H140. 
Uh, very briefly, this is a proposed LMA to change the property from the RH zoning district, which it currently um, is designated to the CRTF district, which is a uh, commercial residential uh, floating district. Um, the property is currently improved with a um, single multifamily um, residential tower that I believe has um, 141 dwelling units. It's approximately 140 feet tall with a two-story parking garage. Uh, the property is currently all residential um, affordable housing. And the zoning change will allow um, increased density on the lot. They're proposing to build a second um, apartment building. So it's a multifamily dwelling with uh, 76 dwelling units, approximately 98 feet tall. Uh, also all affordable housing. Uh, the OZA hearing was on April 12th. Uh, my report and recommendation is included in your packet. Uh, it does recommend approval of the application, the binding elements uh, contained in that report. Um, very briefly, um, my report will um, uh, explain that we recommend um, approval of the floating zone plan with the binding elements that the, um, the FCP in the application is um, conforms with the 2013 Long Branch Sector Plan, is compatible with the surrounding area and adjacent properties, uh, and is supported by adequate public facilities. Uh, I would uh, note just very briefly that after the hearing, we reopened the record to include what's been marked as Exhibit 45, which is the updated or the revised floating zone plan that has the binding elements um, actually listed on the plan itself. Um, that's the, the conclusion of my report. I'm happy to answer any questions from the Council um, about this particular L LMA. Okay, thank you, Mr. Baumgartner. Any thank questions, you. colleagues? Okay, is, yeah, Council Member Reamer. I just wanted to observe, I, it's a great project, and I think it's a terrific example of a nonprofit or a mission-driven housing partner uh, doing a redevelopment that preserves affordable and adds housing. Um, they needed the MAP amendment because the council made a decision years ago not to change some of the zoning on that side of Silver Spring. And um, I think this is real evidence that, uh, you know, there, that might not have been the best approach because they have had to go through a very, very extensive uh, process to get to this point. But, um, Again, I think it's a terrific example of a mission-driven development project, and uh, we uh, we want to we ought to see this happening a lot more in the Purple Line corridor because uh, there's a lot of opportunities for this. So I'm glad to support it. Thanks. Great. Um, is there a motion, Ms. Indu? Anything to add? I have nothing to add. No. Okay. Great. Uh, is there a motion to approve the report and recommendation? So moved. Second. Councilmember Reamer moves. Councilmember Freitz and seconds. Um, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Great. That is unanimous. Thanks, everybody. Um, item 3E is a work session on ZTA 1907 Telecommunications Towers Limited Use. Actions tentatively scheduled for 72721. Let me recognize Chairman Reamer. Okay. So today we're going to go through uh, any amendments that have been offered and they have been provided in the in the packet and um, and um, we'll have plenty of discussion. Um, I, I, I just want to observe uh, Councilmember Rice and I have an amendment in there uh, that was requested by some of the folks inside the permitting process um, that we are not going to move actually. Uh, we, we think the permitting team is not quite lined up the way we'd like to see them lined up. So there is one amendment in there that we do not need to get into today uh, relating to the tower committee. Uh, we can just pass on that. Um, so there are a number of other amendments and um, I'm pleased we're, we're here today. This has been, a, as, a, as I've observed, a five-year process um, of trying to do what we have to do under federal mandates and what our, our comparable jurisdictions in the region have have done. Uh, the committee's recommendation I think is a strong one. Uh, I also have to you know, fairly characterize it as somewhat more restrictive than our regional counterparts. Um, 
And I know it's not restrictive enough for some, but uh, it is it is more restrictive than DC or comparable Virginia jurisdictions. So, um, you know, we've we've I think solved a lot of problems with this. There's a few amendments we'll discuss. Some of them might, are are very minor from the county executives, uh, you know, last minute set of recommendations last time, and council staff has helped us sift through those. Um, and then there are some uh, larger amendments that we'll be debating that would have a very significant impact on deployment. So we can uh, get into those in turn, and uh, and. I suppose we're not taking a vote on the underlying ZTA today, but uh, we can dispense with the amendments and then it will be whatever remains that is before us for a vote next week. So I will turn it to council or back to you, council president and turn it to council staff. Um, thank you, Ms. Indu. Do you have anything at this point or should I get to my, our colleagues? Uh, so I guess there's two options I can go through each amendment one at a time and we can pause and move each amendment as I go through them or I can go through all of them and you can move them at the end. I guess before we get that one, uh, we have a few requests to speak. One, I start with council member Rice. Okay. Well, no, what I wanted to do is go ahead into the uh, amendment. So I Great. agree with okay. what Ms. Madu was saying, Mr. President. Thank you. And council member Katz, do you have any opening comments here? Or yeah. I do. Thank you, Mr. President. And I will be I will be brief as I try to always be. But um, I'd like to make a, just a few preliminary statements um, before we get to the amendments. The issue, to say the least, this issue is complex. It's um, at times emotional, and it's uh, certainly technical. Um, I said last week that I would like to support the legislation in general. And I believe that 5G, if done properly, would benefit Montgomery County. I thoroughly respect my colleagues' thoughts and opinions on this matter, and I thank the Fed Committee and others for all of their considerations. I realized that during the discussions last week on the matter of having a multi-stakeholder working group brought up by uh, Councilmember Glass, that there was not support for it. Uh, it would have allowed for the group to meet and we would have taken up this matter in September after our August recess. I'm sorry that there was not support for it because I believe that's a very important element of this legislation going forward. And therefore, at this point, uh, when 1907 comes to a vote next week, I will vote against it. Um, I am very concerned about the placement of towers near residential homes. Having said all of that, I do believe that the legislation has been made better by amendments that, that I did support, and hopefully other amendments discussed today might make this legislation uh, better as well. And I appreciate all who have come and brought them forward. I'm saying all of this up front because I do not want anyone to believe that if I'm supportive of the amendments, then I'm supportive of the overall legislation. Again, I want to make it clear, even though I'm not supportive of the overall legislation, I am most appreciative of all of the hard work that's been put into this legislation by the public, the Fed Committee, and all my other colleagues. And I sincerely thank Ms. Nadu for preparing this packet, who I spoke to last week as well. And I know she has done an unbelievable amount of work on it. Thank you, and I yield back to you, Mr. President. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilmember Freitzen, you're on your amendment later, right? Great. Okay. Ms. Ndu. Okay. So the first amendment is actually two different amendments and they have to do with heights. Um, these are being uh, sponsored by council member Rice. Um, so the very, the first one basically establishes a minimum height of 25 feet in residential areas. So in re a lot of ne residential neighborhoods, there are what I'm going to call historic street lights that can be rather short. They're, they can be as low as 14 feet tall. So the way the amendment is drafted currently, if you can add six feet, that only brings you to 20 feet, which might still be too tall for an antenna. So the language, which is on uh, page two of my memo, um, two and three, is what it does is it says you can add that six feet for those narrower roads or you can go up to 25 feet and you could get to pick whichever is greater. Um, and the benefit to doing it this way is since we already know they're probably gonna need at least that 25 feet, they won't have to then, you won't have to trigger the waiver and objection process to get the additional height um, unnecessarily, which reduces the burden on OZO. The second one is a similar amendment, but in commercial areas. So in some of our commercial areas, 
There was a picture in the county executive's packet, but a shorter pole will be located closer to the intersection for aesthetic reasons. But you actually want to encourage installation at intersections because you get better coverage, which could mean fewer antennas. So with this amendment, if you have a short pole close to the intersection, and let's say one 50 feet away that's slightly taller, when you're deciding what height to add to the shorter pole, you can use the height of the taller pole that's 50 feet away. And what will, this will do aesthetically is rather than having an applicant say, well, I didn't want to have to go through the waiver objection process, so I'm just going to add 15 feet to the already tall pole. With this amendment, they can add the additional height to the shorter pole, and aesthetically, the two will look similar. So you make the shorter, tall, you make the shorter pole a little taller rather than making the taller pole super tall. Um, and those are the two amendments, and I will go to Councilmember Rice since it was his amendment. So, Ms. Nadu, I just really want to thank you so much for your great explanation, but also laying it out in the packet so well and helping us to understand uh, where the county executive was coming from. So, uh, with that, I, I don't think I have anything to add on top of Ms. Uh, Nadu's explanation, so I'd like to move uh, both of these amendments. Second. Hey, Councilmember. Rice moves, Councilman Reamer seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor of the amendment, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Okay, so the next amendment is on page three. Um, and this one is from council members Reamer and Rice. This is actually a pretty minor technical amendment. Um, so in the section of the ZTA that talks about the location of towers, it said the tower. This amendment changes it to a replacement tower since that you wouldn't be using a new or existing one for this section um, of the ZTA. Mr. President, I'd like to move that amendment. Councilman Second. Councilmember Rice moves, Councilmember Reamer seconds. All those in favor of that amendment? Any discussion? All those? Yes, Councilmember Friedson? Are you voting? Okay. All those, all those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. That is unanimous. Terrific. Ms. Ndu? Okay. So moving to the bottom of page three, top of page four. So this is some preferential placement language um, being brought by Councilmember Friedson. So this encourages certain locations for towers. I'm actually just going to read it because I think that's the easiest way to do it. So what it says is, Whenever it is legally and technically feasible, the replacement poles should replace pre-existing poles that are located closest to intersections, closest to property lines between dwellings, along the non-front-facing side of residential properties, or abutting properties used for non-residential purpose. In addition, the replacement towers must be at least five feet from the area between two parallel lines extending from the sides of a residential front door, I will explain that one a little bit. Basically, if you're standing at your front door, you go out, like you do a straight line to the sidewalk, and then you move out five feet so the pole's not directly in front of your house. Um, and then if the applicant cannot meet the foregoing standards, the applicant must include in their application an affidavit proving that either permission from the pole owner cannot be obtained or service cannot be provided using a pole at an alternate location. So I know that preferential placement language is something that a lot of residents want and that a lot of the council members want as well. Um, so this is a good way to encourage that, but does not bump up against the FCC order because it says if the applicant can provide an affidavit saying they couldn't do that, then they'll still be allowed to place that poll. And I'll move to council member Friedson. Uh, thank you for the description. I won't go into the description. I think everybody knows why we're, we're doing this. We're trying to address the uh, concern about, uh, you know, the uh, placement of the poles, and, you know, I think this does a really good job of uh, trying to find uh, both uh, encouraging and uh, ensuring the least aesthetically obtrusive placements. Uh, I will note that uh, this is uh, adopted largely from language uh, from the county executive that uh, council staff uh, helped to, to, to tweak to, to make operable, and, and so, uh, you know, we had been uh, working at uh, doing this in committee, we hadn't received the language, and so we're putting it forward uh, now because we hadn't received it uh, up to this point. But uh, I think we achieved what we've been trying to achieve throughout the process uh, related to preferential poll placement here. So I'd like to move the, uh, the amendment. Okay, so 
Second. Okay, Council Member Preetz moves, Council Member Reamer seconds. All those in favor, any discussion? All those in favor of that amendment, please raise your hand. Okay, that's unanimous. All right, Ms. Ndu. So as Council Member Reamer noted, noted, we're going to table the removal of the Tower Committee amendment. So we're now jumping to page five. Uh, so the next amendment is Council President Huckers. Um, and this is a tiered approach to setbacks based on the type of road. So for a road that, and all the types of roads are in the county code, but I can list them. So for freeways, major highways, parkways, arterial roads, county arterial, minor arterial, industrial streets, and county roads, it would be a limited use with a setback of 30 feet. For primary residential streets, principal secondary residential streets, secondary residential streets, tertiary residential streets, rustic roads and alleys, um, it would be a limited use setback of 60 feet. And then with conditional use, you could get up to 30 feet. Um, and the reasons for this um, are for bikers and pedestrians to preserve the tree canopy um, and similar reasons. Um, I don't know, uh, Council President Tucker, if you'd like me to go through the details first, or if you'd like to speak first. Um, well, I uh, thanks, Ms. Ndu. Yeah, my understanding, uh, after talking to some of the advocates and some constituents, I, I want to be responsive um, to their concerns, that this would put us closer to the posture of the uh, um, uh, legislation in Howard County and Baltimore County, uh, which obviously are under the same FCC um, order as we are. Um, and it would be would still allow tens of thousands of siting locations. So. Um, I thought it was, um, you know, a, a somewhat of a thoughtful compromise. I can't, I can't move it myself. And my colleagues are interested in moving it. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable supporting it. Any discussion? Councilmember. No. Oh, oh, sorry, uh, Councilmember Katz. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I will move the motion. Okay. Uh, and uh, is there a second? Second. Okay, Council Member Jawando, Council Member Katz moves, Council Member Jawando seconds. Any discussion? Council Member Reamer. Yeah, um, I think the, the real issue here is that what we're trying to do, what we have to do is allow for antennas to be deployed uh, on the utility poles and the light poles, you know, everywhere. And um, this amendment would basically really limit where they can be allowed. Um, and uh, it would even create a, a strange incentive where as we're trying to lower speed limits, you know, neighborhoods that would have, uh, you know, better street design for safety and, and road narrowing and, and those kinds of things might even uh, be at risk of becoming wireless uh, dead zones. Um, I think that this amendment and, and the next uh, are highly restrictive to deployment. And uh, I, I apologize if this analogy is strained, but I think it is sort of like saying to homeowners that they can only put their Wi-Fi routers in the basement. You know, what if they have a home office in, in the bedroom level? You know, you've got to allow the deployment to be where the signal is needed. And, uh, you know, our, I think our federal mandate is to allow it to be on, you know, the streets. Um, so council staff, I think, has a good analysis of, of the issue here. But, uh, you know, I think it is uh, would be very, very problematic to go in this direction and would cripple the deployment that we're trying to achieve. Thanks. Um, Chairman, let me just, can I just ask as a follow-up, is it your understanding that, that, um, uh, this, that there's re similar restrictions in Howard County and Baltimore County? Uh, you know, I, I haven't seen that. Um, and I can't speak to whether those counties have modernized their code to the level that they should. Uh, I can certainly say mm -hmm. DC and Virginia have, you know, some have no restrictions whatsoever. Sure, you those can, are different states, obviously. Yeah, well, they're, they're they're taking a supportive approach to the deployment. 
sure. or some have 10 foot, 10 foot setback. Uh, you know, I, I, I'd like to ask council staff, what would this, what would the setback be then on streets that are, you know, smaller, narrower, slower speed limits? So I'll, um, so first to answer that, uh, Council Member Reamer's question. Um, so part of the reason the Fed committee had reduced the setback to 30 feet with conditional use lower is for those narrower streets. I did talk to DOT and there are several areas in the county where there are streets that are narrower than 30 feet wide. So this would limit deployment in those areas. Um, I can also answer um, Council President Hooker's question about Baltimore and Howard. So Howard counties is actually that the, it reads in residential districts and rights of way must be set back from residentially zoned lots, a minimum distance equal to the height so the setback is whatever the height of the pole is. So that can vary. So if you have a 25 foot pole then you're gonna end up with a 25 foot setback, which is actually less than ours. Um, that legislation is from 2017. So it does predate uh, the FCC order slightly. Uh, for Baltimore County, they have a 200 foot setback um, for neighboring property lines and its conditional use. Um, I will note there aren't, I know there's been a lot of questions about setbacks and it's gonna come up with both this and the next amendment. Um, so there aren't a lot of cases on setbacks, mostly because the FCC order is new. So to put it bluntly, people, not too many people have been sued yet. Um, there is a New Jersey case where the court found that a 100 foot setback was too limited. Um, that isn't to say what they'd say about 30 or 60 other than if you're limiting, my, my legal opinion would be if you're limiting service in entire neighborhoods, that could be considered effective prohibition. The thing that the court really looks at is why is the setback this low? In that case, they said there's no obvious relation to aesthetics to make the setback so high. And so that's an effective prohibition because the argument being, it's really that you're just trying to control the RF emissions. So that's sort of where the case law stands. And there's some pending cases in California about setbacks as well um, that will probably also focus on, was this really aesthetics or is it just RF emissions? Um, I will note for some of the aesthetic concerns, as you know, Council Member Navarro introduced an amendment last week about minimizing um, tree loss. Um, and also that the hearing examiner is already instructed to look at existing tree coverage as well as vegetation. Um, for the pedestrians and bike safety, um, all I could say to that is that the poles won't be in the middle of the sidewalk necessarily, of course, um, and the hearing examiner does have to consider visibility from the street. So that was council staff's analysis and answered some of the questions. Okay. Thanks. And of course, it would allow um, poles at 30 feet via conditional use, though, correct? Right. Yes, that is what the amendment states. Council, Council Member Katz? Thank you. I was going to point out that exact same thing, that the that uh, it, the 30 feet would still be allowed by conditional use. And I appreciate uh, Council Member Reamer bringing up the idea that, that the next uh, tiered approach is, is certainly something that probably both of these should be discussed together. Um, I, I believe that as much as we can possibly do it for residential, that we have to be extremely careful on what we're doing on the pole placement. And, and, um, the, the, the concern about, um, uh, downtown Silver Spring versus, uh, other, other places, uh, it, it, the zoning ordinance still would be involved in that. So I don't know why this would this would be um, uh, any more detrimental than 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 what is being I, I don't believe this would be as detrimental as what is being suggested. So I'm I'm supportive of it. I believe that where we are putting poles in a residential area is of great concern, and especially where there are uh, right now underground. Uh, underground utilities. So anyhow, that's where I am on this. I believe that that we should either uh, approve this one or we should approve the uh, the second one, which I also know uh, Ms. Nadu is, is not uh, supportive of, but I think we should do something to give additional conditions to, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the residential uh, neighborhoods. Thanks. Thanks, Council Member Cat. I'm sorry, Council Member Jawanda. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I seconded this in part just for discussion purposes so I could ask some questions and wanted to understand it a little more. So uh, the uh, so I guess I guess to Mr. Do or whomever's able to answer this question, 
how many towers would this, what would be the comparison of what would be allowed, not allowed versus the uh, existing draft under this amendment? Do we have a number? Uh, somewhere in an old memo. <laughs> Give me one second. Uh, if the council member will, uh, my staff tells me it's about half. That about half of the polls would be unavailable under limited use. That's what that's what my staff says from the maps that they look at. So, yeah, I'd, I'd like to. Yeah, I appreciate that. If, if if there's a way to confirm that, and then also to Councilmember Katz's point, even if that was the case, there would be a conditional use process where others could come into play. Is my understanding correct? Yes. For close, for close, right? Okay. Um, and I know Mr. Dew's looking at that, so I'll ask another question while that's happening. Um, the, uh, and, and we did answer the question, Baltimore County is more restrictive. Howard County is, depends on the height of the pole, right? So it could be, could be around the same or a little less depending on the height of the pole. Is that right, Mr. Dew? Yes, that is correct. Um, and for those numbers, so... Uh, it's so I guess the question is, are you asking for under 30 feet or for the between 60 and 30 feet? Well, both, if you have it. So I have 12.5 percent for less than 30 feet, 30 to 45 or 25 percent of poles are 35, 30 to 45 feet. Sorry. 18 percent is 45 to 60 feet and then 44 percent 60 feet or more. So that adds to, this is, I know a lot of math, but that adds to 100. So the ones, you'd have to add the first three to get what's under 60 feet. Does that make sense? Yes, which if I so did the math. So basically, council member, ringers number that, yes, it would be half if you have it at 60 feet is correct. Half under 60 feet. And then the, the, the number between 30 and 60, which is still be allowed with conditional use, is what again? It'll be about 40%. Okay. Only so twelve. So twelve percent. Only twelve percent is under, is under thirty. Yeah, yeah. Only twelve percent is cut off completely. Okay. Yes. And, and I will are, note that this amendment does not have any provisions having to do with because the conditional use setback would be limited to thirty feet. There'd be no way to get anything under thirty feet. Right. Which is we set a process in the committee for allowing under thirty feet through the condition through a modified conditional use process. So this would replace that. Yes, that would be the biggest difference between this amendment and what Fed did. Okay. All right. Thank you for the information. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Albernoz. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the amendment, understand the intent, but I think it is more than being achieved through the other amendments that have both been put forward in our last session and very thoughtfully by Councilmember Navarro and also by my other colleagues. And I also want to thank the county executive uh, whose team put forward some amendments, which also made sense, and we supported this morning as well. So I'm comfortable uh, with the legislation's current amendments that address, I believe, the issues that uh, our council president is trying to get to through his amendments. So I will not be supporting uh, this motion because I believe it's being achieved in other areas. And to council member Katz's point, we're all concerned uh, about the a residential community. We've, I think, been very thoughtful in hearing those concerns. I really appreciate, once again, central staff sorting through a lot of complicated information and give them a lot of credit for helping navigate us through this process and the Fed Committee once again as well. So um, I look forward to the second discussion uh, for the next amendment. But in principle, again, I, I believe we're achieving all of that and are putting forward um, something that's more restrictive than our other neighboring jurisdictions who are much further ahead than we are on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Reed. Right. Thank you. Yeah, I, I would, you know, this would severely restrict deployment. It would, there would be no allowance for under 30 feet. You would have an ex cumbersome process for 30 to 60 feet. I think it really goes in the opposite direction of what we were seeking to do, which was to put boundaries, provide community protections, but ensure that we do get deployment. And so, uh, you know, I, to both of these amendments, you know, I think council staff's analysis is uh, spot on and I'm 
commend it to my colleagues. Okay, any other discussion? Council Member Friedson. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly note with the preferential placement amendment that we just approved, the mm -hmm. numbers that uh, Ms. Nadu uh, was mentioning uh, would be impacted significantly. I mean, we have put forward now you know, a significant amendment which uh, reduces uh, the ability to place on any uh, poll. I also think that that was the most equitable way to try to address uh, that concern, uh, treating you know, residents throughout the county uh, in, in a similar fashion and addressing similar concerns uh, that they might have uh, with uh, the, the issue. So I uh, appreciate the, the rationale behind it and why it was put forward. I, I think that we've you know, attempted to address it uh, in a, a different way, uh, and I think we've uh, done so already, uh, as was noted, uh, by the Vice President uh, with the other amendments we've uh, put forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, any other comments? If not, all those in favor of this amendment, please raise your hand. Councilmember Katz, Councilmember Hucker. Uh, all those against? Councilmember Albernoz, Friedson, Glass, Duando, Novato, Reamer, Rice. Uh, motion fails. And go on to the next one, this and do. So this next tiered approach, and instead of being based on type of road, is based on speed limit. So for roads where it's greater than 50 miles per hour, it would be limited use to 30 feet, and then conditional use to get you up to 10 feet. 30, if the road is 35 to 50 miles per hour, it's limited use 45 feet, and conditional use to 30 feet. And then for roads under 35 miles per hour, the limited use is 75 feet and the conditional use is 60 feet. Um, so uh, the staff analysis of this one um, is similar to before about those narrower roads. Um, and also just a quick note that in the county, I assume the intent of this amendment is that those slower residential streets are going to have the higher setbacks. I do want to note that in Montgomery County, there are some really busy streets that have slow speed limits. So picture like downtown Silver Spring, where you could be going 35 miles per hour, even though it's a more dense area. And some of those streets actually already have poles. So those ones wouldn't have been allowed under this new amendment. Um, Listen, dude, Council Cats, sorry, go ahead. Well, can I just ask you about that example? Wouldn't downtown Silver Spring be covered under the previous commercials ETA on this topic that we passed? Yes, it is, yes. So it wouldn't be covered by this? Resident. It wouldn't be covered by this, so I, I just meant to use that as an example of that there are streets in Montgomery County where the density isn't necessarily tied to the speed limit. Um, that was the point I was trying to make. Sorry. And they're in residential areas, unlike downtown Silver Spring. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so this amendment actually, it's attached to the packet, and it's pretty long. It has a lot of different parts. Um, I can go through all the different parts and then open it for discussion, or you can discuss after sort of each section of it. No so, okay. uh, <laughs> sure. Um, so um, as for some of the other provisions, um, one, it limits the amount a hearing examiner can increase the height um, to only five feet over whatever the limited use standard is. Um, for any deviations from limited use, um, the hearing examiner would be required to find that those deviations are essential for regulatory compliance. And the provider and the hearing examiner would have to explain in detail the factual and legal basis for concluding that denial would violate the FCC order. Um, the hearing examiner would be allowed to provide for alternate for alternative methods of concealment. Um, and then it adds factors for the hearing examiner co to consider, such as the smallest footprint possible, concealment from other properties, um, notes about noise and vibration, and again the tree minimization. Um, and that uh, can't adversely impact historic and environmentally sensitive areas. Um, next, this amendment would say that a conditional use permit must have a condition on it that the provider must update with new technology. If new technology becomes available, that is incommodious. Um, it would require an annual inspection by DPS. Um, there's some changes to how notice is done. So notice that to be on the website and mailed. Um, residents would be able to pre-register for the hearing. The sign would have to have a QR code that would have to be, that you could scan to get the hearing information on the website. And then you could get 
um, notification both by telephone and email if there's a change to the hearing date. Um, for completeness, um, a failure to verify completeness of the application. Um, if the, so basically if you apply and the application is incomplete and has to be sent back when it's um, resubmitted, it would trigger a new application to not violate the shot clock, um, but they would have to pay a new fee. Um, for consolidation, it limits the area that can be consolidated, which is currently 3,000 feet to 1,000 feet. And then the Board of Appeals would be put back in, but would have um, an expedited process and would not be able to deny oral argument. Um, I could go through analysis of any of those if council members wish. Um, just as a more general statement, I will note most of these are additional burdens placed on OZA. Um, I have spoken to them, and one of their concerns is they are extremely small staff. There's only two hearing examiners and a couple staff, so a lot of these changes would probably be make it a little difficult for them to meet the shot clock, um, as well as might strain their limited budget. So that was OZA's concern with these amendments. But I can go over the details of any specific ones. Okay. Uh, thank you, Libu. Yes, we don't want to be incommodious. Uh, Council Member Katz. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I will move this motion. I have a feeling that we don't need to have in-depth conversation because if I get a second, that would be another another part of this discussion. But at this point, because of the previous conversation, there's no need. I, I, I don't know that there is support, though I believe there should be support for this. I don't believe that there is support, and I don't want to. I don't want to continue a conversation that's not not getting us anywhere. So, with that, I will move the motion. Okay. Is there a second? Okay. Looks like it dies for lack of second, Councilmember Katz. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, um, Ms. Do. Back to you. That's all I have for amendments. Um, I'm happy to answer any further questions about the ZTA, of course. Any other questions from colleagues? Um, seeing none. Oh, Councilmember, you know, Chairman Ream. Uh, not a question. I just want to thank all my colleagues. This has been a unusually arduous process. We have been, we have had to grapple with very difficult issues and very intense concerns coming from, uh, from many. Um, I did want to share, you know, although we do not regulate on the basis of health, uh, I have posted several times in the past few days what I think is critically important guidance from the FDA, the National Cancer Institute, the American Cancer Society, the World Health Organization, um, you know, in many, many all of the leading scientific institutions that have purview to this issue uh, have weighed thousands of studies conducted over decades, and they are very clear in their conclusion that they are, they are, they're not seeing evidence of health impacts from our, from our phones. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, the CDC was another one. Accepting that scientific consensus, which I, I should observe, there can be a study or, or more that contradicts the great bulk of studies. It's the great bulk of studies that these agencies review. And so often in public dialogue, you'll see someone point to one study that shows one thing. But the scientific agencies review all the studies and they are very firm in their guidance to us that they are not concerned about health impacts from the phones you know, and the towers provided all the federal rules are fo followed, which of course they would be. So on that basis, there really isn't justification to restrict the deployment and certainly the, the public benefit of growing wireless networks and capacity is undeniable. And uh, I'm glad we have gotten to this point and we are ready to dispose of this issue uh, and we can spend our limited time and, and efforts uh, working on things that, uh, you know, will also move us forward, but aren't mandated as well by the FCC. So thank you very much for your participation. And I especially want to thank my colleagues, Councilmember Albernoz and Councilmember Rice as co-sponsors, co-lead sponsors of this zoning text amendment. You provided the, the strength to ensure that we were, we were pushing through and Councilmember Fritz and Councilmember Jawando, your deliberations at the committee 
I think gave us a better ZTA and one that we all understood much more fully. And I think we came up with a very strong committee recommendation. Uh, it provides a voice for the community and it ensures that we all get what we want, which is growing and you know always improving connectivity uh, for our lives. So thank you so much. And again, Lavu, thank you for your terrific staff work. Much appreciated. Okay, thanks Chairman Reamer. Thanks to everybody on the Fed Committee and to the co-sponsors as well. Uh, a lot of work has gone into this. Thanks, uh, Ms. Uh, Indu, as well, for all your hard work and your very thoughtful uh, and thorough packet. Um, next, I think we can move on to the consent calendar. Let's move the consent. Let's approve the consent calendar. Councilmember Reamer moves. Councilmember Rice seconds the consent calendar. Any request? Councilmember Friedson. Yeah, I just uh, like to be listed as abstaining on item I and voting in the affirmative for the consent calendar. If it's okay, with, we don't have to take it off the, the calendar and have a separate vote if that is in order. I, I think that's fine. So you're in, you're, you're in support of all the others and abstaining on I. Um, all those in favor of the, the consent calendar, please raise your hand. That is unanimous. Great. Uh, now I believe we can recess until 1.30. Great. Thanks, everyone. Good work.